on the models of the atom. The reason we're doing this is because we're going to start nuclear physics in chapter 25. So we're going to learn about fusion, fission, what happens at the atomic level. In order to do that, we need to understand what is physically there at the atomic level. And even to this day, it's not really fully understood. There's still new theories all the time about the idea that electrons aren't really in orbits, um, and the idea of shells doesn't really make sense, and it's actually a probability distribution where they could be the idea of Heisenberg principle. There's a lot of new stuff in physics, a lot of theoretical ideas. What we're going to do is we're going to go um, from one stage to the next through the history of the atom and then see how it's going to apply to what we're going to use when we get to fusion and fission. So to start this first, okay, to start the look at uh, the different models of the atom through time. So the first thing that was thought of, this was during Newton's time, was the atom was the smallest, most fundamental particle and it was a sphere, and it was tiny, and it was indestructible. It was thought that the atom could not be split, it had to be a little sphere, and it was indestructible. It could not be split, the same thing as indestructible. Okay, now, this was way back in the day. In around 1900, another theory came out. Anybody remember who came up with the next theory? We learned some of this in like chemistry and stuff. The names will ring a bell, but anyone remember who the next was? It was? J. J. Yeah, J.J. Thompson. Very good. Let's look at the Thompson model now. The Thompson model, and this is something that I don't know if you know or not, but I'm going to explain. The Thompson model came about because they experimentally determined that the atom had some electric nature to it. Experimentally determined that there was some electrical nature to the atom. So J.J. Thompson said, well, if there's some electrical nature, it means that there has to be these positive and these negative charges. They've got to be separate from each other. So what he did was he said, you know what? The atom we've conceived now as a giant sphere of positive charge with these negative charges embedded all in the actual volume. So the old model used to be called the plum pudding. Honestly, plum pudding was a dessert in the 60s that no one ever eats anymore. So think of a watermelon. Think of the watermelon itself as a giant positive charge. And think of the seeds in the watermelon as these electrons or these negative charges that are dispersed throughout the body of the giant positive charge. Okay, again, this came about simply because they discovered that the atom had some electrical nature to it. Um, clearly we know that this is not correct. Okay, what was the next model? Anybody remember? That's after that. Yeah, Rutherford's next. We'll Rutherford was next. Okay. Now, Rutherford, I mean, it is on the next slide, so you could probably like, slide that. No, I didn't do that. Obviously, you do. So, the Rutherford model came about for as, a result, as a result of what experiment? What experiment? Uh, did they put something in between it? Hey, you're on the right track. Uh, didn't they? I think it was like a piece of gold foil and they shot wages through it and you saw that the wages were being squeezed on that. Close, very close, yeah. So they shot these beams of alpha particles, not lasers, but similar, similar. They took a gold sheet, okay? And the theory, remember, the theory at this time, according to Thompson, was that the atom was this big sphere. So what they expected to happen was either a particle would not make it through and it would get stuck. The other particles would get stuck in those spheres or it would make it through completely. Okay, that was the idea, the concept behind it. Now, when they did this experiment, they took a, a, a sheet of gold foil, fired alpha particles. Alpha particles are really helium nucleuses or nuclei. It's two protons and two neutrons. So it's a positively charged particle. So they sent these positive particles at the gold foil. And what they recognized, using like a film behind it, they, they developed the film afterward. So they were able to develop this film, like the camera would develop film afterward. And they recognized that most of the particles made it through. Almost all. But like one out of every 5,000 or something ridiculous didn't make it through. And not only didn't make it through, it got rebounded in another direction. So as a result, they recognized the fact that, and I say they because it's never just one person, 
it's usually Rutherford and like his students, or Rutherford and like his peers that did this together. But a lot of these famous scientists, a lot of the students are the ones who actually came up with either the experiments or did the lab work for them. But it was named under these guys because they were the ones who like kind of ran the whole thing. So they they recognized the fact that because most of the particles made it through, the the atom was mainly empty space. But they also recognize that because some of them were rebounded, and think about this, right? A positive charge could only be rebounded by a positive charge. So they recognize that the nucleus must be these dense little cores of positive charge. Because the positive alphas hit the nucleus and then rebounded. Or they just made it through. So the conclusions as a result of this were that it was mainly empty space with a positively charged <coughs> nucleus in the middle. Now, they also recognized, and this was something that they came up with that was actually false. They came up with this conclusion, and the conclusion makes sense. If you think about the model as this, and this is all we know at this point, they came up with the conclusion that the atom must be unstable. They did that because of the opposite charges. And think about it for a second. You've got this positive nucleus. You've got these negative electrons around it. What do opposites do? So why aren't the electrons spiraling toward the center and like self-destructing on itself? So they thought, you know, over time that's what's going to happen. So they said, all atoms must be unstable. And that's all they knew at the point in time. It turned out that that's false. Not all things are unstable. Some are unstable indeed, but most are not. And later on they figured out this idea of a weak force and a strong force. And these, there are these intermolecular forces between the particles inside of an atom. We've talked about, I think in chemistry, we've talked about van der Waals at one point. Um, we're going to get to that in chapter 25, the idea, but that was another conclusion they made here, that the atom was unstable, that conclusion is not actually true. Okay? So not every experiment that led to these different breakthroughs were always true statements. They had hypothesized a lot of things that were not always true. Like Thompson's model helped Rutherford come up with his idea. You know Rutherford actually completed this experiment and it took him two years to come up with his theory. The experiment was completed. They took two years to analyze the data and come up with a conclusion, and this conclusion that we came up with here. Okay, so it wasn't like overnight. They weren't like, oh, this is what happened, that's it. These ideas were theories. They were not proven true at the time. So now we know that some of the stuff in this theory is true. Okay, from more scientific evidence. Third, oh, actually, let's say, before, sorry, before we get to the Bohr model, let's talk about why the Bohr model came about, and this is why. So, did you talk about this last year? Atomic spectrum? Did you hear about this in chemistry, specifically? I don't think you did. I'm trying to think back if it was in my chemistry when I was a kid. You, you heard about it in physical science? A little glass tube? Yeah, you know what it is? It's a neon light. Like a neon light from the sun. I was going to give you an analogy to it. So, Here's what this is, the atomic spectrum. You take a tube of gas, that gas is then, or then a, a voltage is applied across that gas, and what happens that's interesting is that gas gives off some sort of a light, some neon color usually. Okay, that's like the neon, we're going to talk about this in a moment, it's like the neon light, light signs in the school. Now, if you take that light, pass it through, a single slit in a sheet of some sort of barrier that doesn't allow light through, then that single ray of light goes through a prism. After that happens, what you get is this dispersion, right? We talked about dispersion earlier with optics. Prisms disperse light. And what they recognized was that as the gas changed, so for different gases, the result changed. So for example here, this is helium gas at the bottom. This is the spectrum that occurred when the helium gas was applied a voltage. The light that resulted from the helium gas was then passed through a prism. This is the spectrum on the bottom. Much different than hydrogen gas at the top. Okay, so as a result, what they were able to recognize was that every element gave off its own atomic spectrum. Every element gave off its own atomic spectrum. Now, not all elements occur naturally as gases, so it's not easy for all of them. So if you look at ones that they utilized here, okay, HG, is that mercury, am I correct? Mercury? Anyone remember their periodic table? 
What's Mercury? Is HD silver? It is Mercury? Okay, it, it is. I wasn't sure. Silver or gold is AU. It's the Latin stuff. I forget what it comes from. Anyway, this, this is Mercury. Mercury, as you know, or maybe you don't know, I don't know, it depends on how if you remember. Thermometers used to have this silver liquid in it, and that's mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature, actually. Okay, so it was not difficult to get mercury to be a gas. But something like, I don't know, uh, aluminum, that is a solid at room temperature, would be more difficult to make that into a gas to test this in this experiment. So things that were easy to make into gases were used here. This is the exact same thing a neon light does. A neon light has gas trapped in the tube, you then turn it on by plugging it in. Well, when you plug it in, what is that? That's voltage. That's our potential difference. So when voltage is applied to a neon light, it shows up as a color. When you unplug it, what happens? It no longer shows up. If you break the tube of a neon light, the gas will actually escape and it won't work. Okay, so that's why you have that glass tube around the tube. You see there's like an inner tube usually inside of those neon lights and an outer tube. So if the outer one breaks, the inner tube is what's holding the gas, so it still works. Okay? Still functions. The concept here, though, is this. Every element has its own atomic spectrum, which enables us to determine what mixtures are made out of. It, it, it enables us to determine that the sun gave off a different element. For the longest time, sunlight was not understood. They took sunlight, they did this experiment on it, came up with a new spectrum. So as a result, they named sun or sunlight helium because the sun was called Helios. Helium is the actual gas that comes from the sun, and you're getting it. So when the solar light came through, they came up with this new spectrum that had never been determined, and they titled it Helium because of the sun and Helios. Uh, what else? This is very, very, very useful for forensic science. If you sign up for forensic science next year, you're going to learn about this idea with the spectrum. You're going to learn about the spectrum of elements. So if you, for example, had a substance or a mixture, you can separate it into its components and understand what it's made up of using atomic spectrum theory. It's a lot more advanced than this was, okay? It's not just a gas or a light. It has to do with separating the pigments in different colors and testing it in a machine that uses like a centrifuge to separate it also. So it's a little bit more than just this. But the idea of bombarding it with some sort of like energy and seeing a result is what's used in forensic science, but in a different application. Now, Bohr ran with it. Okay, Bohr said, you know what? I'm bored of this old model. Oh. <laughs> and as a result, and as a result, Ooh. by the way, that was on the spot right there. I, I never said that one before. I saw oh, that right there. It's pretty good. Because I never said Bohr said. So, I didn't say last yes, year. you did, No, well. I didn't. I swear I didn't. I just thought of it now. Maybe I just thought of it. I'm not, I would never lie. I'm lying, guys. Let's check your recording. You can check the recordings. They're still there. Check last year's recording. I never said that. Maybe I thought of it last year, but I never said it. So, uh, so Bohr, yeah, Bohr was talking to his old mom. And he said, you know what? Something else is different that's going on. So, he took the idea of atomic spectrum and said this. The atomic spectrum... The, those lines, those colorful lines that were showing up, were at discrete increments from one another. They were at discrete distances. And what he recognized, he said, was that, well, you know what? This is probably the electrons at different orbits. And he came up with this concept because he realized that the only way the voltage interacts with the gas is because of the electrical nature of the atom. Well, where's the electrical nature of the atom? It's the electrons. So as a result, it must be the electrons that are causing these spectral lines to be different. If those spectral lines are at specific distances, it means that, you know what? There must be something specific about the electrons, and that's where the idea of shells came about for electrons. So Bohr said that it's got to be this positive nucleus and negative electrons, and the negative electrons at different increments of height from the nucleus that are keeping the whole thing together. But they're not too close to the nucleus, or else it would start to, you know, implode on itself, the idea of it being unstable. Um, he then also said that if an electron moves an energy level, it gives off energy, or it absorbs energy. So, think back to chemistry. 
Electrons, when they're at their normal state, are called ground level. Okay? If you bombard a nucleus with photons, let's look at the next slide actually to see this. If you bombard a nucleus with photons, the process of spontaneous emission occurs. And here's what it means. The nucleus, or the, the atom, I should say, not nucleus. The atom is bombarded with photons. It hits an electron. If the amount of energy from this photon is the exact amount of energy difference between these shells, it'll move up. For example, every energy shell for electrons is at a different level of energy. So at the ground state, it's zero level. At the first state, maybe it's like two joules. It's not. I'm giving you easy numbers. But then at this state, it's like eight joules. Then the next level is 20 joules. So you have to get this exact, precise amount of energy in order to jump up to that shell. So I'm going to pick random numbers. They're very simple numbers. Okay, let's say this is the nucleus here. Let's say this is shell one. This is shell two. This is shell three. And let's say that shell one is the ground state, no energy. Shell two is an energy level of two joules. Shell three is an energy level of five joules. Well, what happens here is this. If the electron at ground level gets bombarded with two joules of energy, where is it going to go? Two joules. Where? To the layer. To the next layer. Well, to the layer that has two joules of energy at that level. But if it gets hit with one joule of energy, nothing happens. It doesn't move halfway. It doesn't move at all. It just stays where it is. If it gets hit with five joules of energy, it moves to the second shell. But if it got hit with four joules, it does not. So these are what's called discrete amounts of energy. It has to be a discrete or specific amount of energy. Now, if the electron's at energy level two, it needs to get hit with three joules of energy to get to energy level three. Because it's the difference here, five minus two is three joules. To go from here to another one higher, it needs to be another specific amount of energy. Yes? There, you have, you have two, four, four, two, but then it goes eight, and those are the valence electrons, yeah, for each one. But this is different. This is like, why does the, why do the electrons give off energy is what we're going for, as opposed to what shells do they fill up first? Yeah, it needs to get to eight to fill that shell, then they go to the next shell. This is about energy levels and electrons moving from shell to shell. Do you have any proof for this, or did he just At the time, it was theoretical. Yeah. At the time, the idea was completely theoretical. Um, the concept of spontaneous emission is what he was kind of going for. The idea that these electrons move at discrete distances. Now, let me correlate this back to the atomic spectrum. The theory that Bohr came up with, the idea of the spontaneous emission in this concept, came about because the atomic spectral lines are at specific distances. And what he recognized was that those specific distances occur in a lot, even for different elements. So he said, well, you know what? There's got to be a specific amount of energy that's different here to cause those energy lines to show up at those sort of specific locations every time. So as a result, he said, you know what? If it's not exact, it won't work. Okay? If you don't bombard it with the exact, precise amount of energy, it won't go from one level to the next. Now, those energy levels are much, much higher than the actual amounts. Okay, the actual amounts are on like a 10 to the negative 19 level for joules. Those are just random ones I'm telling you about. Uh, let's see. What's a photon? What's a photon before we go any further? A particle of light. A particle of light. Okay, it's a packet of light. So we're looking at one little amount of energy of light. Now, as an electron absorbs from us, you photons, afterward, it gets excited. It jumps to the next level. Now, everything always wants to get back to ground level, though. Everything. Even humans. You don't realize it. Drop your pencil or your pen and wants to get to the ground because the ground is ground level. Zero potential. When it moves up, it gains potential. The potential to do what? To move back down. Really. And when it moves back down, when the electron jumps back down, it emits some sort of energy. That energy could be a photon. It could also just be some sort of radiation. Okay, now what our goal is, is to determine that amount of radiation. How is that done? It's done using the following equation. Okay, E equals H omega. This is called Planck's equation. Planck's equation. 
And Planck was another scientist who had a, who had a constant named after him. This is called Planck's constant. Oops. 3.36, not 6 point. Sorry, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. Units of joules times seconds. Pat, could you open that middle window a little bit? It's really annoying to open, but it's a Doesn't Yeah, it's P-L-A-N-C-K. Some pronounce it plum over here too. Okay? So this is this is Planck's constant. Planck's constant tells us there's a relationship between the amount of energy given off by that electron when it returns to ground level and the frequency of the radiation emitted. Folks, we need to focus more. Stop talking on the sign. Too much chatter. Again, this is not easy. That's why I'm going over it like four times. This electron drops down. It gives off energy. That energy is capital E. Planck's constant is a number. If we know the amount of energy given off, we know Planck's constant, we can determine the frequency of radiation and therefore know the type of radiation. It could be infrared, it could be visible, it could be ultraviolet, gamma, radio. There's a lot of options we looked at with the EM spectrum. Our goal is to find omega, find the frequency. Okay, now, think about units to make sure that this makes sense. Units of energy are joules. Planck's constant is joules times second. What was frequency measured in? Hertz, but what's a hertz? Anyone remember? If you don't know, you can probably figure it out by looking. What's hertz? Hertz is actually another unit. One over seconds, very good. And clearly what Jenny noticed is, look, for these seconds to cancel, that's gotta happen, right? And then you get joules equal joules. Energy equals energy. So the unit of hertz is really one over seconds, seconds cancel, leave behind joules equals joules. So let's take a look now. Let's take a look, actually before that, let's make one more application, then we'll look at an example. Have I spoken to you guys about the Northern Lights at all? No. Okay, so this ties in last chapter of magnetism we just finished in this chapter. So, remember the Earth is really a giant magnet. Okay, there's a North End and a South End. There's the geometric North Pole, the geographic North Pole, which is really magnetic South, and then there's geographic South Pole, which is really magnetic North. And if you recall, a magnet has field lines that come out and enter the other end. So the Earth has this magnetic field doing this around it. Now, if there is a magnetic storm near the Earth, sometimes you will see these magnetic field lines. You can actually see them. You can see them on a lot of moons and planets further out in the solar system. You will literally see field lines around them, these magnetic field lines. And what will happen for the northern lights is this. So, around the northern pole, there's this congregation of field lines. Okay, there's this like high density location of field lines, very strong field near the North Pole. And what happens is that magnetic field traps photons. It traps these photons, and the photons interact with the gas in the air. What is air made up of? Nitrogen? Oxygen? What else? Carbon? Literally helium? Argon? I think that might be it. Okay, I think somebody said hydrogen. Hydrogen also. Okay, there's like five or six gases that are made up or that make up the gas around us. Now, when you see the northern lights, you see many colors, don't you? Yeah. What you're seeing is the atomic spectrum, really. And here's basically what's happening. Those gases absorb the photons that are trapped in that area due to the magnetic field. When they absorb the photons, it excites the gas. Then the, the electrons jump up to that level. They return back to the lower level and they emit radiation. They emit radiation at different frequencies dependent upon what gas it is. So you see these different colors around the northern lights. So the concept of photons and spontaneous emission with magnetism is really the meaning or the, the reason for the, what is that called? Aurora, Aurora Borealis or something, the northern lights. Okay, that's really where it actually comes from. Example. Okay, that's a little bit tricky. Okay. Grace. It's a little bit tricky. You're going to kind of struggle at first with this one. 
So, we've got an excited electron in a mercury atom, and it drops from level 4 to level 2. So what does it mean when it says it's excited? It's excited. It's going to move, okay, good. It's going to move. Excited, usually, yeah, you're moving if you're excited. For electrons, something that's excited is above its normal level. So if it's excited at level 4, it means it doesn't belong at level 4. It belongs to level 3, level 2, or level 1. So what's going to happen to it? It's going to want to move back. So that's basically what's happening here. It drops from level 4 to its ground state of level 2. And these levels, these levels are dictated by the amount of energy needed to get there. So the energy of level 2 in a mercury atom is 4.66 what are called electron volts. Write that down, please. EV is an electron volt. And I tell you in the next sentence that one electron volt is the equivalent of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That number should ring a bell. Why is that familiar? Yeah, it's the charge on a proton in coulombs. This is the amount of energy. It's not a coincidence that the word electron is in electron volt. An electron itself would be negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So as a result here, what we can do is we can determine the radiation and the frequency. But we have to think about this physically, what's happening. So here's our nucleus. Level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4. So here is the electron hanging out at level 4. And it drops two energy levels to here at, ne at level 2. So what's the change in energy, or what's the energy it must give off? Remember, it had 5.43 electron volts. It gave off a bunch of energy. It said, I'm going to emit this radiation, and I'm going to end up with only 4.66 electron volts. What is the amount of energy given off as a result of changing from 5.43 to 4.66? How much energy is it? What do you got, Victoria? Uh, 0 0.77. 0 0.77 electron volts. That's how much energy this electron gives off in the process of reducing itself from level four to level two. What if it were the reverse? Instead of giving off the energy, the electron would absorb the energy. Okay, absorb the energy. It'd be, I mean, it would be endothermic because it would be some heat there. So this is the amount of energy that the electron gives off. The formula is E equals H omega. So this is going in for E. But the problem is it's in electron volts. I need this in joules like we said a moment ago. So take 0.77 electron volts, multiply by the conversion factor. I want to get rid of electron volts, so where do I put that? Yes, I hope everybody said that, but I did hear at the top from a few, the bottom, come on. It's in the top to start, you want to get rid of it, put it in the bottom. One electron volt is the equivalent of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. EVs cancel, so just simply multiply this by this to give us the amount of energy that this electron gave off in joules. What's the amount of energy given off in joules that this electron exhibits? Marion? 1.23 times 10 Good. Okay, that's the amount of energy in joules. A very, very, very small amount of energy. But again, we have to consider the fact that this is on a small scale. We did something like this yesterday with that force that was applied to a proton moving. We were able to use F equals MA to recognize that the acceleration was very great. Now, H is a constant. 6.33 or 6.63. I keep getting that one mixed up. I've got to memorize this one. 663 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. Look at your units. What happens to joules? <laughs> Leaving one over second. And that's what Jenny told us a moment ago is what hertz is. So look, we're getting hertz as our answer because it's omega. What do we get? What do we get? Practice, practice, practice. Uh, 
I got a much bigger number. Check again. There you go. Is that a 34? Yeah. That makes sense because they're successive numbers. Huh? 23 is Avogadro's. 6.67 times 10 to the 23 or something like that, I think. I think it's Avogadro's number. Times 10 to the 14th? 9 or 8? You said 9? 8, 5. Okay, 9. Perfect. So, last thing. Shh, listen. So, based on, based on this frequency, listen, folks. Based on this frequency, we can determine that this is infrared radiation. Remember, the scale that we looked at had all those different frequencies and wavelengths for each band of the PM spectrum. This turns out to be infrared. Okay, so look real quick. Is your homework on Monday? Your homework is due on Monday. Okay, we have a double on Monday.